Welcome back to another special episode of Locally Grown In, a podcast all about empowering entrepreneurs like yourselves to grow more local food. My name is Henry Gordon Smith. I'm the founder and CEO of Agritecture, and we're doing this podcast from lockdown, from COVID-19 lockdown in Muscat, Oman. And I'm joined by actually my host. I call him my Corona refugee host, the person I've been crashing on his couch and brainstorming the future of agriculture in the region and spending every single minute of every day with, we have Majid here. How are you doing, Majid? Good, good, and we great to have you. <laughs> yeah, you're not sick of me yet. Um, we, we were just discussing, we don't even know what day it is. I mean, I think I've been here 47 days yep. since my flights were canceled and I couldn't get out, but um, I'm not complaining. It's been, it's been great to uh, spend every day of every minute in your living room. <laughs> I'm just kidding. We, we, we get to go out sometimes and we've actually been able to talk to a lot of different farmers and, and companies as well. And, and so, you know, work hasn't stopped. It's been really great. So I think for our audience, Maji, it'd be really good if you could just kind of briefly explain what is Oman about? Oman is uh, about peace. And there's a fun fact about Oman. It's the only country that starts with an O. Oh, my. <laughs> so so that's that's cool itself is unique yeah and then also like the location of oman is uh very unique good it for has... our audience to learn win like a jeopardy show in the future exactly, it's gonna be a question yeah. they get okay. the only country starts with an o oman <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah oman has a very unique location in the world it centers the world basically and it has um you know an open area to the virgin uh gulf and then also the Indian, and then the mm. Arabian Sea, and then the Indian Ocean, which makes it very attractive for international trade, you know, throughout history, actually. And um, it's all about peace. The, 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 the method of people living here, they don't make enemies. And as, as you said, it was called the um, Switzerland of the Middle East, basically. Yeah, I know. I think that's appropriate, not only because of the diplomacy and how Oman tries to work with many different groups that struggle to collaborate with each other, countries and, and groups and religions, um, but also because of the mountains. <laughs> so it kind of has a little bit of both. So uh, Oman is, is extremely beautiful. I've, I was able to visit uh, with my colleague Brianna. Shout out to Brianna, fellow co podcast host. We went to Salala, which is in the south, which is a beautiful, almost touristy natural area where there's, uh, you know, waterfalls and water holes and amazing, amazing beaches and mountain ranges. And, and the temperatures are quite different from here where we're a little bit in the middle, almost north here in Muscat, Oman. But there's mountains throughout the country. It kind of is all along the coastline. And so really stunning beauty, both from different rock formations to different kinds of beaches to even just different climates throughout the whole country. Yeah. So uh, Oman, in, in terms of the weather, uh, in the south, during the summer, during this time, it's a bit like, you know, colder. The weather is a bit nicer. Yes, the sun is very, you know, uh, it has high temperature, or mm -hmm. achieves high, high temperature. But then over the winter, uh, the weather becomes lovely to, you know, walk around. More and, mild, more temperate. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and it rains like, quite a bit down there too, right? Well, this year, surprisingly, maybe because it's, uh, you know, Corona, nature is changing and all yeah. that. <laughs> this is actually one of the years that ha Oman had, you know, uh, a big percentage of rainfall. More rain than usual, yeah. Than usual. So the, the kind of the varied climate, and some of our interviews will speak about this, but the varied climate really allows for a wider variety of crop production than, say, Saudi Arabia or some of the other uh, states in the GCC or, or the Middle East. So that's been really interesting for me to learn about. You know, I think a lot of people think about the Arabian Peninsula and they think of just desert. Yeah. But there's so many different types of actual microclimates on the peninsula and Oman has a big variety. So they can grow a lot of fruits and vegetables. They even have dairy production. They can actually grow through different parts of the year depending on where they are. There's kind of these higher elevation areas that have different opportunities. And then these areas that have rainy seasons, almost jungle-like weather, uh, that is also really interesting. Yeah, um, there are some areas here which are, one, one of the examples is the Green Mountain. That specific area 
it, like the, the atmosphere or the, the climate around that mountain is similar to the climate in Greece, surprisingly. Mm. So all the crops that grow in, in Greece or like in that area in, in you know, Lebanon yeah. area. That kind of ideal Mediterranean climate where, exactly. it's, where it's dry and, and kind of stable in temperature. So, so all the crops that grow there, it grows in the Green wow. Mountain and yeah. it's only in the Green Mountain, which yeah. is very, you know, unique in my opinion. So you go to the Green Mountain, you see like peaches growing outside you see like a lot of different crops from the usual that we see outside basically which makes me excited great well i'm excited too and hopefully we're going to help some other people improve their farming or start new farms coming up but but first i want to have a couple announcements in the face of COVID-19, Agritecture has accelerated its digital content. We have a digital conference series, which you can find at youtube.com slash agritecture, over 30 free webinars for you to enjoy. So definitely go check out our YouTube channel. And also big news, we recently launched Agritecture Designer, which is Agritecture's first software product. What it is, is it has a free concept tool. It has six online urban farming classes with a commercial focus. And then it has an online farm business planning tool where you can plan the 10 year economics of your farm. You heard it right, guys. You can actually design and plan your business online now. You don't need to go straight to a consultant or talk to a bunch of different technology providers. It's now online from your home. So stay home and design the future of agriculture with Agritecture Designer at design.agritecture.com. One last thing I want to say is we've got two really awesome interviews coming up. One of them is with an actual vertical farmer in Muscat, Oman, that's been growing leafy greens and a variety of products to the local market. Going to talk about the challenges and successes he's had. And then we're also going to interview someone who represents kind of an industry group and almost um, kind of a conglomerate of companies that represents a little bit of the government angle here in Oman that's going to talk about the ver variety of products. But before we get into that, because it's COVID-19 and we're in lockdown, we've had some difficulty accessing the audio equipment that we need to maintain the audio quality we like to have on this podcast. So just a small disclaimer that the audio is a little rough, but the content is awesome. So let's dive into the interviews. You ready, Majid? Sure. So next up, we're going to have a really exciting interview with an expert in Oman on agriculture. And we're really looking forward to this. And Majid, my colleague, is going to introduce him. All right, we have Mr. Saleh Hashamfari. He is the CEO of Oman uh, Food Investment uh, Holding, and we are doing a you know a small talk about the the agriculture update and the pandemic, the the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic update here in Oman. Mr. Saleh, would you uh, tell us about your background and uh, what you guys do at the Opic Group? My name is Saleh Al Shanfari. I'm the CEO of Oman Food Investment. Uh, it's called OFIC for short. This is the company. We're a group of various food-related companies. We invest from, uh, say, seafood to agriculture produce to milk collection, dairy, uh, red meat, and poultry, and so on. So we're a, we're a group of, of companies that all fall within this company called OFIC, which is a state-owned enterprise that is focused in, uh, basically in food security and uh, try to, to make the country more food secure by focusing on basic needs, basic commodities, and uh, to allow the country to be in a very uh, stable state when it comes to food. At the same time, provide service to uh, various SMEs, farmers, fishermen, and so on. Mr. Saleh, could you uh, also talk about, uh, you know, a little bit uh, the, the uh, pandemic COVID-19 and how is it affecting uh, the agriculture, specifically agriculture Oman? We in the country have uh, utilized the COVID-19 pandemic as an opportunity to focus on self-sufficiency and focus on logistic mm -hmm. management. Successfully, the country have utilized the COVID-19 mm -hmm. pandemic uh, crisis and converted it into an opportunity. You go to the markets, this is the only country in the whole region where uh, mm -hmm. food, food shortage was not there. The Oman Air, which is a national air carrier, because they don't have any passengers to carry, was utilized to transport food from various parts of the world. It's great to hear that the adaptation is going well to this crisis globally, especially in, relative to the rest of the region. What's the main reason why Oman has been more resilient to COVID-19 than its neighbors? I think it's uh, the readiness. 2008 food crisis was a lesson. So we started at the country level at the Ministry of Agriculture and various stakeholders to start 
uh, looking at the possibilities of being ready. So food reserve was designed in a way to make the country resilient to, to crisis. Early days of the crisis, we started meeting with various stakeholders uh, through Ministry of Agriculture, Ministry of Trade and Commerce. They all started working together with various fund agencies. That helped. That helped a lot. The country is also uh, in a better position when it comes to uh, the infrastructure from a logistic perspective. Major ports, Salal port is one of the global uh, you know, ports, uh, and then uh, Sohar ports, is, they're, uh, they're all, and Dukhan ports, they're all open to the ocean. There's no huge insurance cost, there is no conflict area, it's open to the Arabian Sea and to the Oman Sea, where we have very close access, a couple of days to India, one day to Pakistan, Yemen. East Africa and so on. So the access, the location, the position of Oman makes it uh, in a more stronger position when it comes to its ability to have better access to food from uh, so global sources. How do you see the farmers adapting to this? What are some examples you can give us of farms that have had to adapt to this crisis? Today's farmers, I think, are more advanced, more, 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 more clever, more educated. You know, a lot of farmers have started immediately using social media likes of Instagram, the likes of Twitter, and, and other means to communicate to the whole country. I mean, this is amazing how farmers were able to adapt quite fast. At the same time, the Farmers Association were able to work very closely with the platforms that were developed recently to collect produce from farmers and to sell them through the digital means. So the ability of the farmers to adapt through digital uh, trans- transformation, for me, was amazing. I want to talk a little bit about these small farmers, right? So, so smallholder farmers, at least uh, in different parts of the world, especially where they're near cities, serve restaurants. And restaurants have been shut down in COVID-19. What has happened as a result of restaurants being closed for these farmers to sell their product at a high price? I mean, the case here in Oman, I mean, farmers are not dependent on restaurants at all. They serve department stores and they serve the, uh, you know, grocery stores and uh, there was no impact on, on, the, on the farmers on this side because restaurants have never been uh, the, custo- the, the consumers directly from farmers. Where do restaurants typically get their produce from? I think most of the restaurants go to the flea markets. They buy from the, uh, the wholesalers okay. or from the department stores. That's, um, that's not the same as, I mean, every no. part of the world is different, but that's a very interesting aspect of the resilience and you know, maybe, a, maybe a model for more of these kinds of food hubs to supply restaurants a, a, as well. So that's great. And so let's talk about technology. So you mentioned hydroponics and aquaponics. Why do you, why do you think that those technologies are going to be more important for Oman in the future? One of the reasons is because uh, the, the limited land, the limited water, and because the whole country is moving toward produce more with less. The way we believe the country should, should be moving is to focus on producing more using less water. I mean, that's, that's quite important. And uh, using less land, less, less resources. The only way to do that is by adapting more technology toward uh, what we call water conservation and soil conservation and land conservation and become more efficient, you know. So vertical farming becomes uh, a choice and uh, more uh, recycled system, aquaponics, more hydroponics means and ways to, to produce quality and, and healthy food. It started somewhere here and there, a low percentage, but I think penetration has started and we have to see more of that coming. Let's talk a bit about Muscat, if you don't mind, and, and urban agriculture. So I've, all, I've been in Muscat, I've been in lockdown, but I haven't necessarily mm-hmm. seen very much agriculture happening within the city limits. And globally, we're seeing a renaissance. It's not something new, but a renaissance of people growing on rooftops, people growing in vacant lots, more and more community gardens, even vertical farms. But there seems to be a limited number, a very limited number of them. And maybe you correct me if I'm wrong, but could you talk a little bit about urban agriculture in Muscat, Oman, and, and what you've seen? And if you're not seeing anything, why you don't think it's happening? It happens partially, you know, but I think what needs to happen more, and this is, I'm uh, happy to k- talking to a number of people like yourself, to introduce a simple way of doing vertical farming within the household. If models are made available, uh, modular small vertical units, that, I mean, that, that should be a, a good move. Do you see more young people excited about starting businesses in agriculture in Oman? What's the trend there? And if it's not growing, what do you think is needed to grow that to respond to inevitable food security challenges that everyone's going to face? Well, thank you very much. Yes, I mean, Oman, uh, well, this is the challenge. The challenge is that given the harsh condition 
in the outside. So reality becomes very tough to work in the outside. However, if we're able to find ways and means to do indoor agriculture production, more uh, technology driven, you will see a trend of the new startups, the new SMEs called agropreneurs uh, will start coming. These are graduates from uh, tech schools, from agriculture schools, who really, you know, uh, see the world differently and they want to farm differently. These are young people who have uh, converted and made their own drones that allow them to do proper uh, measuring of the date uh, trees and do the pollinization, which was done uh, manually in the past. Today, SMEs in Oman who have started spray of chemicals and herbicides, pesticides, using drones only. You know, uh, drones now are being used to, uh, to monitor various conditions of the farms. That's the kind of revolution that we love to see and where it will attract more SMEs, uh, more, uh, you know, agropreneurs to start, uh, you know, engaging in, in agricultural practices. We have to introduce mechanization and digital transformation of the farms or else it becomes very difficult to work in the farm, you know, this harsh, harsh condition. And uh, true, we yeah. have seen the farms where technology is ad- adapted. You will see a lot of young Omanis and ladies that, that are currently working indoor farming becomes uh, a trend. And that's the way it, it should be uh, viewed. Uh, same time in the big farms where you need to grow in, in open fields. Luckily, it's all done mostly in wintertime where temperature is beautiful and temperature is, is, is good. And there, heavy machinery is utilized. And uh, that's one of the attractions, heavy machinery, air-conditioned uh, tractors. We have to adopt new technologies that allows young entrepreneurs to come to agriculture. I, I've seen the trend, it's happening. We're very close to the farmers, very close to the young people who are really coming back and showing interest, you know. I think the ecosystem today is all geared toward supporting all these new initiatives. And I hope uh, after this, we, we don't go to business as usual. This should be the new normal that allows us to uh, move faster and be able to adapt to the future mega trends in agriculture practice. Well, I think you said it perfectly, describing young people's interest in technology and the importance of learning from COVID-19 and not going back to business as usual. Thank you so much for your insights today. It's a great honor to have you and to share with the world all of the exciting things that are happening in agriculture and technology in Oman. So we look forward to doing that. Thank you so much for your time today. Well, thank you very much thank for sharing so to talk to your audience. At the same time, I'd like to uh, welcome anybody who have a great idea or wanted to test it here in Oman. We're, we're opening the whole country for FDIs, those who have great agriculture ideas, unwanted partners who wanted to uh, Oman to test their technologies. Uh, everybody's welcome. Oman, Perfect. open for business. You heard it here on Locally Grown In. Okay. Thank you so much again. Today, we're going to be speaking to a vertical farmer in Muscat, Oman, in this incredible country in the GCC, learn all about what he's doing and learn all about the future of his business. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Jaber Shima. How are you doing, Jaber? I'm doing fine, Henry. Thank you for having me. Well, so nice to meet you. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person, but obviously we're doing this virtually because of social distancing during the time of COVID-19. But thank you so much for your time today and joining. It's been really interesting to connect with you and learn more about what you're doing. And we're excited to share that today with our audience at Agritecture. So to begin with Jiber, let's just get started. Can you tell us about your background and your journey and how did you get involved in vertical farming? Okay, so it's going to sound a bit odd to most of the people. My educational qualifications are in biotechnology and microbiology, and I hold a master's degree in computer science. Once I completed all that stuff, I actually went ahead and joined a shipping company from Denmark called Merz Klein and worked with those people for 18 years. I quit my job somewhere in 2010. I started a small consultancy business, helping small business in logistics to grow up and stuff like that. Uh, but really what I was doing is I was doing a lot of uh, research work because I had worked in uh, different parts of the world, Southeast Asia, Europe, Middle East, uh, Africa. I was talking to a bunch of my friends who were in consulting to figure out what could be the next top two or three verticals to look into or get into over the next decade or so. I came up with three major uh, basic uh, verticals verticals which I found very interesting after a lot of reading and research. They were all kind of correlated to one single factor and that is the human uh, population. So on the top three were uh, agriculture, healthcare and education. So after thinking, I actually decided to pursue my future in healthcare and agriculture. This was somewhere in 2014 that I started to look around and find what I would like to do in agriculture. And of course, at that point of time, there were a lot of uh, greenhouses that were happening around uh, Oman in the region as well. 
But what intrigued me was that the challenges that greenhouses faced in this part of the world due to the temperature and uh, the climate, I thought that technology could be the best solution to get over these hurdles. So tell us a little bit more about why you chose indoor vertical farming versus greenhouse or aquaponics. And tell us about what you're growing and, and what the final product looks like. Now, greenhouses, uh, I actually got introduced to a South Korean company which was selling greenhouse technology. And that's how I learned a bit more. And I realized that whatever you do in this part of the world, there are going to be times, specifically the high seasons of May to September, when even a greenhouse with the best technology is not going to work out or give you what you need. So that kind of pushed me to understand that, okay, what is that we can be doing more in terms of technology to, you know, enhance what is happening on the ground. And like I said, just uh, researching around uh, on the web and trying to find out solutions, it kind of connected the dots, the next level in agriculture from greenhouses which could be used to produce food 365 days a year consistently. So that is the reason that I'm not saying I did not try to do greenhouses, but at the end of the day, I found that that may not be very, very useful to do in this part of the world. And that's how I took this next step to use technology or find technology, which could be implemented in within this region. Coming back to the question, what we do right now, at our farm right now, we broadly produce leafy greens. So we do uh, about four or five varieties of lettuces, uh, like Lolo Rosso, uh, Romaine, and uh, stuff like that. We do microgreens. So we do sunflower green, we do baby arugula and stuff like that. We have also done a bit of uh, growing with herbs. We have done cilantro, we have done dill. And uh, more recently, we have added some exotic greens like kale, bull's blood, yellow Swiss chard, stuff which the food service industry, the chefs require for their needs. Last year, we did try for strawberries which were quite nice but I wouldn't say that we have reached a scale where we can do it commercially uh, so that's the next thing that we are working on now and I would uh, say thanks to COVID that has kind of given us the opportunity to start doing a little bit of fooling around more so we are actually starting experiments or trials again to see how we can now focus on getting better yields in our growing environment so that strawberries could also become very viable for us. Yeah, very interesting to hear that you're diversifying your crop selection. So as a business owner, as you think about that market, how would you describe locally grown in Muscat Oman? How would you describe the culture of local food production? Maybe a little bit about the import export realities and maybe a little bit about, you know, why you're growing some of these specialty crops. You mentioned restaurants and hotels, but is any of that, you know, demand coming from Omanis themselves? If you look at the stats for the GCC, you would come across a number which varies between 85 to 90 percent. And that number means that most GCC countries are importing their food. Within GCC, only 1 percent or less land is available for cultivation. Oman, in that way, is a little blessed country. It has got land available for agriculture. So there are farms dotted across uh, northern parts of uh, Oman and southern parts of Oman. And uh, they are doing the conventional farming in Oman, where, you know, there is only a very short season where you can grow food. The local market itself has a demand for the kind of products or produce that we grow. There are two types of businesses that are interesting for us. Uh, one is what we call the retail business, the grocery chains. So if you go to all the retail business grocery chains in Oman today, uh, you would find that the majority of products within our category of salad mixes are all importations from either Spain, Italy, Belgium, and as far as US. Uh, it would be surprising for you to know that the products from U.S. occupy the most space on the shelves in the local grocery stores as far as salad mixes are concerned. There is a company from UAE which also supplies salad mixes but in a very small uh, quantity. So there is, that was one of the segments that was very interesting. The other segment is what we call food service which is the Horeca sector as people call it. The major challenge that the Horeca sector finds not only in Muscat Oman but across the region or across the globe. The basic concern is of consistency and quality of product that they want to use. So the chefs are very, very, uh, you know, concerned about what they put out for the people that come to their hotels or restaurants. And that's why uh, the consistency in quality and supply chain becomes a very, very big thing. So we are able to guarantee them a consistent quality of food 365 days a year. So these are the factors which actually made us think about what we want to grow, how we want to grow. Now we are expanding our horizons beyond Oman. We are into Kuwait, we are in UAE. 
and those markets do have a demand for these high end products as well so that's how i see the future developing uh, like you rightly mentioned kale is not a product which is very very well known as a healthy eating option in this part of the world but it's catching up one of the things that i found in my last year and a half of dealing with customers is that most of the customers don't even know what good stuff is available for them to buy so it's a huge effort in terms of educating the customers to promotions to tell them that they now have options to buy products which they never possibly had earlier which are locally grown more fresher more healthier because more all our products are pesticide free since we grow them in an indoor vertical environment it's slowly catching up and uh, within oman i would say that i'd see a future where you know more and more of such produce will be grown by people and thank you i've got one more follow up question and then uh, my colleague majid is going to ask some questions too what is the way your product is packaged and sold what does it look like in the store and and you talked a little bit about pesticide free is that how you market it and give us an approximate price range so the retail business that's the grocery stores we do what we call as a temper proof packing in small plastic clamshells uh, in which we package our processed products when i say processed means our process is simple since we grow in a very high end sanitized environment the produce itself is very very safe but we follow guidelines by the usda where it says that anything that is being sold to a consumer as ready to eat needs to be pre washed so we do what is called as a washing process and then we do a drying process and then we uh, mix these leaves in different proportions and create different skews or different products and that's what we retail one of the unique things that we are doing within our brand is that we are introducing products which are technically or currently not available to the customers so what we see is what our competitors are doing we really don't do those product lines so we have created unique blends of greens which consumers have not really had a chance to have before and that's what has set us apart and it's really helped us to grow our business so in a nutshell uh, the grocery chain business is all about packed units in clamshells we are actually now working on seeing that how we can get more eco friendly package coming into the picture because we would like to move away from plastic packaging in the next one year so we are now working and focusing on companies which uh, do disposable biodegradable packing materials So that's really really interesting Jiber and you know congratulations it's I think it's going to be really interesting for the audience to hear that someone can engage in vertical farming learn about the challenging approach in a new market and start to actually beat out competition with locally grown clean food so that's really really interesting and congratulations on that thank you uh, our uh, brand is called certified awesome <laughs> certified okay. awesome all right i'm close <laughs> i'm close <laughs> I love that. So yeah, you mentioned one of the challenges that you guys are facing is the customer's education. What what are the yeah. other challenges that you face running this company here in the Oman market? One would be that the size of the market is not so large. So when you look at it, the capacity that we have at our farm is too large a capacity to just look uh, to focus on Omani market as such. But we yeah. did this with a very deliberate uh, decision that we would want it to be here in Oman because I am in Oman. Uh, one of my investors is in Oman, so that's why we selected Oman. And the other reason was that Oman is strategically placed in a way that we could reach other markets that we wanted to. so as phase one of our uh, expansion we had earmark that we get into uh, other gcc nations uh, primarily qatar uae kuwait within a period of 12 months which we have achieved except qatar which we had actually done the deal last year but we have not really got it started so you have to be very clear what are you going to produce for this market if you're going to produce uh, let's say the same kind of stuff which the conventional farmers produce during the season you will be kind of not able to sell your produce uh, due to the price war that's number one uh, number two is that once you want to start expanding globally you will need better logistical infrastructure to handle your product so one of the issues we find today is when i want to, when i'm wanting to export to uh, let's say kuwait the produce is uh, kind of sent to the airport management company they don't have proper infra- even though they have upgraded their facilities now but there's still a time lag where between the product from the facility to the aircraft is still taken in ambient temperature trucks and that's a huge okay. deterrent for our kind of product because it has to be maintaining a 2 to 4 degree supply chain throughout the time so then that becomes an issue so i think that has to improve 
there is a lot of food uh, production that is happening in Oman and is getting exported. But I think the infrastructure is not up to the mark and that at some point of time will have to be looked at as well. Another thing which I would say is, and this is my experience is, that more of the Omani entrepreneurs basically who want to be in agriculture, they will need to take the lead to dabble with technology. Instead of being, mm -hmm. you know, followers or doing what somebody else is doing, they will need to get intuitive and they will need to get experimental and take a risk. Believe me, when I uh, did this joint venture in 2015 with our partners in the US and we decided to set up here, first of all, nobody believed this can happen in Oman, which we did. Then nobody could believe that you can produce and sell in the local market, which we did. And then nobody believed that we'll be able to export, which we have started to do. So we came over these hurdles over the past two, two and a half years. And uh, I would say that majority of uh, the new young generation who would want to get into something like this, because this is going to be the future for sure. It's ever evolving, ever changing. New stuff is happening. There are companies which are investing money into uh, developing technology further to grow food, which we have never thought we could grow before. They're having companies trying to do that, but the, uh, the challenge is how to grow them economically. Yeah, very exciting stuff and, and some really good tips for our audience there, both around how you develop new products, how you develop added value products. And I really liked your comments on how Oman could become a leader in this and a net exporter of this if they embrace this fully. And I also thought your advice for entrepreneurs to embrace technology and the localization of technology as opposed to bringing foreign technology in, but developing something that's customized and developed here uh, was all really, really good. Jaiba, you obviously know your stuff. You've got the experience, you've got the knowledge, and we really appreciate you being a locally grown in today and saying it so concisely. How can people learn more about your work, learn more about you and engage with you? Uh, we hardly have an online presence in terms of a Facebook page or an Instagram. We have a website for sure called awesomeproduce.com. The other ways people can uh, get in touch with us is they could write to me and I'll be very happy. They can follow me on LinkedIn and, uh, you know, I'll be happy to engage with people who would like to know more or do more in this uh, field. Thank you so much again to Jiber and thanks for this awesome interview by Awesome Produce. Definitely go check them out. Okay. Thank you, Henry. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Mansoor. Thank you. Well, Maji and I want to thank you all for listening in to Locally Grown In Muscat Oman. We're going to wrap up the episode now with some conclusions. For me, one of the most interesting things was talking to Jiber, learning about the fact that the marketing has worked. You know, if I look at Jiber's brand, I don't necessarily see the branding as its strongest element. And yet, because they're growing food locally, it is popular and it is succeeding. So that's interesting for me. What about you? What did you think from the interviews? I think the interviews were great, were a lot of information we got to learn. For Saleh Shemfari, he showed the, you know, the excitement from the government to invest in the food sector and in the agriculture as well, and to develop it, made it clear for, you know, Oman to open up for investments and for developing this sector, basically, which was great to hear. Yeah, bottom line, there's so many opportunities in the GCC and especially Oman is an underestimated country for being a leader in agriculture in the region, even high-tech agriculture, as we learned from the discussions. You know, the local brands are gonna be successful. The government is getting behind it. There's so much opportunity around entrepreneurship. So Agritecture is here to help. You can contact us, go to agritecture.com and click inquire. We're here in Muscat, Oman now. So if you have opportunities that you wanna develop, maybe developing a new greenhouse or vertical farm, please contact us, we'd be happy to help you. And if you're looking to do something more independent, definitely go to our Agritecture Designer platform at design.agritecture.com, where you can design your own greenhouse or vertical farm online, including a 10-year economic projection. We wanna really thank Majid, our host today, helping me out in Muscat, Oman, and our speakers, and all of you for listening to Locally Grown In. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube or on iTunes, and definitely check us out on social media on your favorite platform at Agritecture. Thanks for listening and let's grow more local food. Thank you.